What's good? What's good, everyone? Welcome back to the show recap with Mo. Well, we're getting ready to get into a brand new episode breakdown of Tyler Perry's Ruthless. But before we get into this thing, make sure to like and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss shit and if it's going down. All right. So the episode we're getting ready to get into is for season four, episode number 21, titled Make or Break. Now, the synopsis for this episode states... The highest raises suspicions about Ruth and Joan, but is able to find the means of escape. The highest is in jeopardy due to a takeover at the compound. Now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into this thing. All right, y'all. So we kicked this episode off with George and Malcolm. Now, in the previous episode, we saw where Malcolm had gotten away from the compound, so he was on the run. But he ended up running into one of the bear traps that George had placed out there in the middle of the field. And then we saw George coming up on him with that boom pow, right? So that's how that episode ended. So in this episode, we opened up with George on top of him with that boom pow, talking about get up. Malcolm is like, look, I can't move. Look at my leg. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, George is like, how did you get out here? How did you get outside of the compound? Malcolm is like, look, I just figured it out. George is like, you're not that smart. And as a matter of fact, go ahead and stand up on that leg so I can take you on back to the compound. Malcolm is now pleading with George, telling him that he can give him some money. What type of money you want, man? I can give it to you, man. And George is like, look, you ain't got no daggone money, so stop making promises you can't keep. As a matter of fact, you can't even walk right now. How you gonna get to where you get to where you gonna get getting? <laughs> Did that make sense? Moving on. Uh... <laughs> How you going to get to my money if you can't get to it, right? Essentially, that's what I was saying. So anyhow, moving on from there, he was like, no, we got to go. Malcolm is like, no, I'm not going nowhere with you. And he says, well, tell me how you got out here. Who helped you get out? He starts to laugh, and then he says, Ruth. George is like, what did you say? He says, Ruth helped me. So, of course, George is like, okay, dude, so if I go to Ruth, she's going to confirm what you're telling me right now. He was like, no, she's going to lie. She's going to say that she didn't have anything to do with it. And you're daggone right she didn't have nothing to do with it because you lying your ass off right now, bro. Go on and put one in him. Go on and put one in him, George. His leg already messed up. But anyhow, move it. <laughs> Moving on from there, though, we see um, George calling in to Lewis to tell him that he caught a deer out there in the forest. And he wants him to go ahead and tell Daikon as well. Lewis is like, do you want me to come out there? Do you get it by yourself? George is like, no, I'm good, bro. I'm good. So going on from there, though, um, as um, George is getting off the walkie-talkie, he's telling old boy to turn over. Malcolm doesn't want to turn over. And he's like, no, I'm not going to turn over. You're not going to make me turn over. And all of a sudden, he got to put them hands on him. And that's exactly what he did. And we didn't hear no <laughs> <laughs> we didn't hear nothing else from Malcolm. The whole daggone show, right? So anyhow, going on from there, we head back over to the compound where we see Lewis going over to see Ruth. And when he comes over there, Ruth conveys to him that he needs to go make this right, right? I need you to go over to that vehicle. I already done sent her over there. She already knows you're coming. And I need you to make this right. And Lewis is standing here talking about how in the heck am I going to make it right? She was like, well, use your love below then. And then he's sitting over here smirking, talking about, well, we ain't got all that time like that. So was like, look, look, you had time off in that outhouse. Like, <laughs> you had plenty of time in there. So make it right. Do whatever you need to do to make sure that she's still in on the plan. Because we don't need any loose ends at this moment. And then Ruth is like, so let me ask you this one more time. Are you good? Are you ready for this? Lewis is like, look, you keep asking me this same daggone question over and over again. She's like, look, I'm trying to make sure we good. Like, are you ready? Are you ready, ready? And he was like, yes, we're ready. So moving on from there, he leaves. And then as he's leaving, here comes River running up on Ruth as well. So he informs her that he broke the laptop of Daikon. So Daikon isn't going to be able to do any research on any accounts with Joan's name on it. So it's like, okay, so why are you over here talking to me? So he was like, look, I need you to know and understand that everything is good right now. So there's no reason to be concerned at all. Ruth is like, look, ain't nothing good right now because I don't trust that chick over there in that trailer. So River goes on to tell her, like, I need you to stay focused. I need to make sure that you hold this together so we don't mess up our plan or whatnot. And Ruth conveys to him, like, I got this. I don't need no help. Trust and believe. So while she's still in the midst of conversating with River, 
up walks, um, what's his name, Manny. Now, Manny is coming over to get Ruth because the highest wants to see her over in the trailer to make sure that Joan ain't lying, right? So as she's walking away from the pavilion, she turns and looks at River and say, I got this. Now, let me just say this real quick before we move forward here. I'm glad that River actually had the opportunity to speak with her a little bit about the situation and let her know what was going down with Joan and how nervous she was and all of this good stuff. Because at the end of the day, Ruth is still taking... Technically, she's still trying to get up out by any means necessary, whether that's working by herself or against, you know, someone that she feels that she can't trust. At the end of the day, she really just wants to get out of there and get her daughter. Right. So anyhow, going on from there, we head over to the back of the compound where we see the abandoned vehicle. Now we see Lewis is coming over there to meet up with Bridget. So when he gets off in the vehicle, Bridget is excited to see him like old times in the vehicle. You know what I'm saying? Bringing back some old things, right? So it's just like, hey, how you doing? He was like, what the hell are you doing? Are you trying to stay here forever and ever, ever? She was like, no, I'm definitely not trying to do that. So it was like, so what were you doing? What were you doing going with the elder mother up here to the trailer or whatnot, trying to rat out everybody on the daggone scene? And Bridget was like, well, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I just I just got so emotional. And then she was like, hold on, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on, wait a minute. Why were you up there with old girl in that room? And it's like, old girl in the room? She was like, yeah, old girl in the room. He was like, man, she has some intel for me. I, was, <laughs> I said, good answer. <laughs> Good <laughs> answer, Lewis. And she was like, no, that's not a good excuse, bro. That's not a good excuse. I said, I thought it was pretty good. She had some intel for him, so he had to do what he do to make it do what it do so she could tell him what to do. So I got it. I understand. <laughs> I understood it. But anyhow, moving on from there, long story short, they work it out. He gives her that boom pile in the car talking about, hey, hide it up under your robe or whatnot. Get ready for the plan. Of course, they got to get some sugar going on in the car because that rekindled some things. That made it feel like it was genuine once again for Bridget and Lewis, right? So anyhow, from there, y'all, we head over to the highest trailer. Now, this is when it started to get a little, mm, I don't know, it started getting a little shaky for me because I was like, what the hell is going to happen to Sister Ruth or Sister Joan? Because this joker right now is acting real crazy. The way he was staring at Joan as Ruth was walking inside of the trailer and I'm like did the elder mother put enough medication in that food he had early or whatnot I hope that she did but you know I guess we're about to find out so anyhow he's looking at her talking to Ruth at the same time and and he's asking Ruth like what were y'all talking about and shit outside she was like what are you talking about and he's like, yeah, I was trying to get my meditation on. I was trying to get my receive my prophecy or whatnot. And I overheard y'all fussing and fighting outside, which is very un like And I don't like it. And she was like, let me get my story together. Let me let me swallow real quick. And she, <laughs> so she's like, mm, OK, it's my fault. And he was like, what? Yeah, it's my fault. And then Joan joins in. Yes, it was. No, it was my fault. No, it was my fault. He was like, hold on, wait a minute. What's going on? Y'all ain't saying a whole lot of nothing. Y'all sitting over here talking about whose fault it was. What's going on? What were y'all talking about? And of course, Ruth got a story for him because she's like, look, it was about you. And it's about my jealousy as a woman. I'm just so feeble and I'm just so weak. And I'm just so jealous of the fact that she's able to go on, the, on, on these trips. And I'm not able to go with you. And it's just me. I just don't want any other woman to be close to you. And he was like, no, jealousy is not part of the Raku. So it's like, I know I'm just a woman. And I was like, man, y'all can't. Y'all keep falling for this every day gone time, man. So anyhow, he was like, you're good to go, Joan. You're good to go. And she was like, oh, thank you, your highest. And then he was like, you know, oh, let me step back real quick. Because there was a funny part on there in that part where she was talking about she was just a woman and all of that good stuff. And she was like, you know, every so often I just be wanting to stump a chick out and not in those words. And she's looking directly at Joan. When she says the words, and of course the highest is like, Ruth, no, 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 that's just, that's not woman-like at all. And she was like, I'm sorry, your highest. 
So anyhow, he excuses Joan and then Ruth comes over and she kisses him and she's like, you know, your highest, I just need. No, she doesn't kiss him because she can't really touch him due to him receiving the prophecy. Right. So anyhow, long story short, she's filling this man's heads up with nonsense, making him believe anything that she tells him. And then he's turning around talking about that, that, that anger, that masculine feeling that you have is coming from the child within your womb. And I'm sitting here like, ain't no daggone child in the womb. <laughs> so I don't know where it's coming from, but it ain't coming from down there, my brother. So anyhow, long story short, she wants to wash his feet. She wants to prepare him for the prophecy. But the highest is like, no, actually the elder mother prepares me for the prophecy herself. And she goes on to tell him like, but she doesn't love you like I do. And she doesn't have your baby within her. So she's she's playing this role right here, y'all. She's playing this thing down to the to the end of the earth, man. Like without any thought of mine, I want him to know and understand that I am carrying his one and only seed within me. And I'm like, damn, that man must be shooting blanks because it ain't nothing. Because <laughs> I'm still trying to wonder that. Like, I know they ain't using no, you know what I'm saying? So. How is it that she's not pregnant? What is she doing to avoid it? Like, I mean, I know that she's not pregnant, but could she possibly be pregnant? I'm just saying, y'all. I'm just throwing it out there in the air, man, seeing if it catches on to something. But I'm just saying, like, if we going raw like that for real, for real, unless I'm just shooting nothing out, then something should be working up there. I'm just saying, maybe she got something tied. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm just putting it out there for y'all to bite on, right? So going on from there, we see uh, Ruth running down Zane to ask her the whereabouts of the elder mother. Zane goes on to tell her that the elder mother is still over there in the kitchen and whatnot. And then, you know, she runs off from there. And I was like, damn, like she didn't even, <laughs> she ain't even had no full-fledged conversation with her. And then Zane is looking at her like, where the hell you going, right? So anyhow, from there, next we see Lewis going over to talk to Daikon to inform him, you know, about the situation um, with Malcolm or whatnot. And um, Daikon is super happy about that whole situation. He also asks about Peter. Lewis tells Daikon that we really shouldn't worry about Peter. He ain't going nowhere. He's really not going to go too far. And technically, he doesn't like the government, so he's not going to go run off at the mouth about what's going on out here with the Rock and Douchey camp or whatnot. So, yeah, I really wouldn't be concerned about that. But old boy Malcolm, yes, we definitely need to get to him before he gets to where he's getting so we can make sure that we're good out here, right? So, anyhow, long story short, though, Lewis touches Daikon on his shoulder, trying to, you know, just trying to reassure him of the situation like we got you we just want to make sure that you're good you you've aligned yourself with great men and you've made this great army of soldiers and he's thanking daikon for you know allowing him to be able to be part of it and all of this stuff whoa, whoa, whoa. daikon is looking at his hand on his shoulder and as lewis is leaving the pavilion daikon stops him and he's like why did you touch me and Lewis is like, look, I just wanted to reassure you that we got you. Like, we're here for you and we're here to support you and we just want you to be calm or whatnot. And Daikon goes on to convey to him that touching is very intimate. So don't do it if you don't mean it. And I was like, hey, man, you don't have to tell old Lewis about that because he's quite familiar with touching. All right. <laughs> just ask around the compound, my boy. So he knows exactly how to get down with the get down. So... Anyhow, going on from there, we head over to the sheriff's office where we see Desiree on the phone at this time trying to figure out what's going on with the warrant so they can move forward with this case because she's super, super worried about not being able to solve this situation. And she feels like this case is getting away from her. Cal is trying to reassure her that it's not. But it is to a certain extent because they're at a standstill, right? So anyhow, talking about Kyle, Kyle and Aaron are both coming outside of the jail cell. So in the previous episode, Aaron went ahead and went back to the back so he can have a little short conversation with Andrew. And I do mean short. It was not very long at all because Kyle came back there and broke it up. So, 
you know, Desiree saw him as she was getting off the phone coming out of there with Aaron or whatnot. So anyhow, Kyle comes up to check in on her. How's everything going? Whoop, whoop, whoop. She tells him that, hey, we're still waiting on everything to come through. And then she sees Cheryl Conley sitting over there in the corner. So Desiree is like, so what is Fat Boy doing over there in the corner or whatnot? Kyle goes on to tell her that he's telling them that he needs to go to the bathroom or whatnot. And she was like, well, is he handcuffed? And he was like, yeah, but I wish that he would do something. Desiree is like, so why would you say that? He was like, because he got his deputy unalived or whatnot. And she was like, yeah, that was pretty dirty. So he wants him to do something right here and now so he can do something to him right here and now. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Or is he saying, you know, I hope that he does something so we can have something to pin on him. Maybe that's, maybe it's the latter. Maybe it's the latter. I ain't going to be too, too messy, right? So anyhow, going on from there, they take their tails over there to the other side of the room to have a conversation. Maybe this was planned. Maybe it wasn't. But it allowed Aaron to sit down and he was close in proximity to, to uh, what's his name, Sheriff Conley. Now, Sheriff Conley was sitting over there like, hey, hey, hey. So, of course, Aaron sees him and he talks to him or whatnot. Sheriff Conley tells him that they're getting ready to have this case up. He was like, how do you know that? He was like, look at them. They nervous as hell. Look at them. They don't know what they're doing. And he tells Aaron to not allow them to go up there because it could be detrimental to the people that are actually up there living with the highest. It could be a bad situation for them, not only for them, but for your wife. So, of course, Aaron doesn't want to hear that because in his head, like, what else can I do? The only thing I can do for the woman that I love is to go fight for her. Not thinking about the other people who are in the equation. I'm just thinking about my wife, Laura. But if you knew Laura for real, for real, like we know Laura, the things we've heard about Laura, you might change your mind, my boy. Any <laughs> so anyhow, moving on from there. Now, as a matter of fact, let me stay right here. Let me stay right here because it was good right here. So when Desiree and Kyle were having this little sidebar conversation and, and Conley had gotten finished talking to um, Aaron or whatnot, Aaron goes over to where they were and he's like, are y'all a couple or something? Kyle is like, no, why would you say that? And Aaron goes on to tell him, like, I can always tell. And I was like, mm, can somebody else tell as well? Because he ain't the only one saying it. Right. And I was thinking about Andrew because Andrew was talking about her little situation shield with Malcolm. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, did he hear that by the ear or did he know that for sure? For sure. By observing. Right. So going on from there, though, we head back over to the compound when we see Zane and her newly released friend Lacey in her purple rain robe. Right. So, you know, they sitting there and they talking and whatnot. And here comes River. Now, River is coming over there and he's specifically wanting to talk to Zane. But Lacey ain't having it. And she's daggone sure that she's not going to allow Zane to have it either. And I'm like, <laughs> hold it down, Lacey. Hold it down, man. So anyhow, you know, River's like, look, you're not going to continuously keep interrupting me while I'm trying to talk to Zane. But since you want to know the facts, let me go ahead and give you the facts. Zane, I was never going to leave you. Who I was going to leave is her ass over there talking in that Purple Rain outfit, newly released. You know what I'm saying? Because she can't go nowhere. She can't run. And I knew that you would not leave her even though she cannot run. That's who I was going to leave. But since you want to sit up here and have this whole little conversation with her, then you can have that conversation. But I'm gone. So River walks off. Zane is sitting here looking at Lacey like, did we make the right decision? Because he's always scheming and planning, right? And Lace is like, forget him. Like, yeah, he gonna make a plan, all right, but it, it it's not going to include us. And as a matter of fact, you know, he is right. That's what Zane was saying. He is right. You cannot run, but I'm also not going to leave you here by yourself. So I hear you, Zane. I hear you. I absolutely hear you, and I feel you. But I'm going to tell you right now, if it was me, oh, brother been gone with that money gone. You heard me. By yourself. Yeah, y'all been by yourself. I would have hit that day bed where I seen them hundreds falling up out of there. I would have been gone. You heard me. Never mind the rest. Anyhow, <laughs> moving on from there, man. We go over to the um, Q 
kitchen where we see the older mother drinking on something, sipping on something. I don't know what she's sipping on, but it's obviously good to her. And in walks Daikon. So when Daikon comes in, he has a question because there was a half-eaten sandwich in the punishment trailer. That's all that was left in there. But no bodies, just a sandwich, right? So he's coming in there to ask about that sandwich that was in the punishment trailer. So he's asking the old woman, as he likes to say, do you know anything about that sandwich? And she's like, no, what sandwich are you talking about? And he was like, well, there was a sandwich in the punishment trailer. And she was like, no, it wasn't me. As a matter of fact, Daikon, we need to talk. He was like, what do you want? We need to talk about Root. What do you have to say about Root? And he put emphasis. <laughs> he placed emphasis on the T, right? So I was like, there you go. That's how you do it. Talk about Root. All right. So anyhow, she was like, she's getting too big for her britches. She's getting too big. The baby is going to her head. And he was like, yes, but what can we do about it? She was like, well, I mean, she doesn't have to have a baby. He was like, so what are you saying? Daikon, you know exactly what she's saying. You just don't want to utter the words out of your mouth. Because then you will be part of this situation. And you don't want that. You don't want the highest to know that you know anything about it. So you're not going to utter the words. But you would prefer for it to come out of her lips. But she's smart enough to say what she needs to say and not say. Because she knows you, right? So anyhow, long story short, he was like, well, I mean, it is what it is at this point. He's noticing it, but he also feels some type of way about Root as well, right? So, you know, she's not happy about the situation. The older mother is like, you know, we need to figure out something. Essentially, that's what she's telling Daikon. Because right now, you don't want her to be as close as she is. She's taking both of our plays. And Daikon is sitting up here talking to the elder mother like, no, she can't take my place. Maybe she can take yours, but not mine. And realistically, Daikon, she is taking your place. She's becoming the companion that you used to be, right? Because she's giving him something that you cannot give him. Let me hold on. Let me tap dance on that a little bit, all right? She's giving him something that you cannot give him. You cannot compete, all right, so let's move on from there. So next, since we're talking about Daikon, we see Daikon under the pavilion and he's, you know, getting people ready for the prophecy. And we see George, Lewis and Manny off to the side talking about, you know, this and this is it. But Manny is sitting over here talking about, OK, OK, what's going on? George is like, look, man, are you in this or not? He was like, yeah, but I don't know what's going on. They ain't told that brother nothing. They just saying, man, just go off of us. Whatever we do, you do, right? So, you know, I think that's wrong at this point. Like, if y'all got me risking my life, go ahead and tell me what's going on, daggone it. But anyhow, moving on from there, Daikon tells Manny to go over to the front of the Hyacinth trailer. Daikon tells um, both Lewis and George to get ready. But then Daikon specifically goes over to George and tells him that there's a meeting in his bedroom and he wants him to meet him there. And George is like, oh, yes, sir. But then he rushes. <laughs> he rushes over there to Lewis and Lewis is like, you ready? George is like, man, you just don't know how ready I am right now. Oh, boy, trying to make a pass to me. He was like, what, for real? George is like, hell yeah, man. He over here talking about there's a meeting in my bedroom. Don't you be late. I was like, what? <laughs> All right, y'all. So here comes the highest. Now, the highest is being carried on his throne by these four horsemen, right? And they walking him up through the pavilion. And these people are celebrating. They clapping. And they're super, super happy and all of this good stuff. And he got those slippers on. So they can't touch the ground, right? So when they put him down, he starts to, you know, to preach to him or whatnot, talking about we're getting ready to go to a place with running water. They cheering, talking about air conditioning, they cheering, and all of this good stuff. Now, we see Ruth over to the side. Now, Ruth is back in the back, and she looks at Lewis. So when she sees Lewis, Lewis sees her. She nods, and he nods, and she walks inside of the trailer and goes straight for the day bed. Now, I don't know if she knew where the other money was, but she went straight to the bed where the money was. So she started putting it in, it looks like a sheet, 
or whatnot. And then she folded it up and walked up out. She ain't fixed that bed right though when she walked up out. But anyhow, she walks out the back, runs over there to that abandoned car back in the back where they meet up all the time, put it in the back of the trunk. And then all of a sudden she ran back and went back to the front of the trailer. And then everything was good. So now when Lewis looks back, he sees Ruth. Ruth lets him know that everything is good once again. And then all of a sudden he looks at George and next thing you know, they pulling him out. The highest is looking at Lewis like, what are you doing? What do you mean? What is he doing? You know, it's, <laughs> you know exactly what he's trying to do. And George, you know, George meeting in my bedroom, George, he pulls it out on Daikon. Daikon can't believe it. Oh my gosh. I mean, I just invited you to my trailer. And you're going to do me like this? Oh, man, I can't believe it. <laughs> so, anyhow, man, that's pretty much the end of the daggone episode, man. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this recap, man. I've enjoyed it. From what I know and understand, the plot is only going to get thicker as this series continues, man. So, I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss shit, Snit, that's going down. I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.